You know, it's interesting as you look at society today, what you notice is, like, we are more connected than ever before. If I want to find a college roommate, if I want to find um, somebody I went to high school with, I mean, you can easily find that online today. But what I also find is interesting is we may be more connected in society today, but I also get a sense that people are more isolated than they've ever been. You get a sense as you talk with people that there is a growing hunger, a desire for authentic, genuine community, more than I feel like has been the case before. So it's just weird dichotomy of people are more connected than ever, but seemingly more isolated than they've ever been. And so I want to talk through that a little bit today. Because what we find as we look at Scripture is that you were made for community. We were all made for community. God designed you that way. He wants you to have a longing for community because he wants you for himself, first of all. And then he also wants you connected in community in the body of Christ. We need one another. We had an issue with the sign out front. So somebody in the church has talents in metal work. Praise God for that because he was able to fix their sign. You put me to that, I'm going to hammer away, and I don't know what that's going to look like in the end. We need one another in community. We need God and we need each other. We were designed for that. God put that inclination in your heart. So if you have a sense that you feel like, I want community, it's because God has put that desire there. So I want us to look at a few passages today that help to inform the kind of community the church is supposed to be. Because you can find community in a lot of ways, and, but instead of just making up our own definition of what community should look like, Let's look at scripture and see what kind of community the church is made for. And so if you have your Bibles, I hope you have your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you can find one underneath the seat in front of you. We encourage you to take, you can grab a Bible, write notes in your Bible. We want you engaging with God's word. And we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 10 this morning, verses 24 and 25. So Hebrews chapter 10, I'm also going to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word today. Simply out of reverence for the fact that God, you gave us your word. We're thankful for that. So we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And to mess you up this morning, we're going to read from the New Living Translation. Um, So if you have your ESV Bible, it'll still follow, though. So Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Man, these are the very words of God. Maybe may be seated today. I do want to encourage you, you know, so often the title slide, it mentions that these notes can be found on version. If you're unfamiliar with that, if you go on your phone, there's an app that you can download, the Bible app, and we like to post our notes there. Today is a great example of a day where you may try to write something down quickly And obviously, we've got to keep moving. So if you want to find notes, you just go to the Bible app, you open up events, and you look for search in our area, and you'll find connection point there. So all of the notes are always there, so I encourage you to find the notes uh, in that place. We will post things as well, but that's the best way for you to keep up with where we're headed. Because as we dive into community today, the first thing we'll find is, is that you were made for community with God. You were made for community with God. It really starts there. You know, the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's perfect community. And so we were made for that kind of community. In fact, the Bible is bookended with a picture of God dwelling with his children in paradise. It starts in Eden. It goes to the new heavens, new earth. So we were made, we were meant to be in community with God. But of course, Adam and Eve, they ate for the forbidden tree. So then that community became disconnected. We were separated from God. But then God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross so that we could be reconnected with God and have that relationship with him. So what we find is that as we get to Revelation, new heavens, new earth, we're back in paradise with God. So that's what God meant to be. And now we're in this in-between of we need to still have community with God. And how do we do that? We devote our lives to him. We say, Jesus, I want to follow you. God, I want a relationship with you. So the first thing you find is, is that you were created for a relationship with God. You were made for community with him. I love how the psalmist writes in Psalm 42. He expresses this so well. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So that desire for community, it starts out of a desire to have relationship with God. We were created for it. So if you're here today and you've not made a decision to follow Christ, to follow God, I'd encourage you Make that decision today. Don't leave from this place without community with God. 
We want you to be in relationship with him because community starts there. But not only that, what we find is the church was made for community, but often it remains a crowd. I don't know if you considered that. The church was made for community, but it often remains a crowd. You know, the word translated as church in the New Testament, ecclesia, it actually is better translated as community instead of the word church that we use. Uh, More accurately, it's an assembly of people. So what we find with this New Testament word is it comes from the word ekaleo, meaning called out. So the church is best defined as a community of people who are called out for a purpose, namely to make disciples. That's why we exist in community. In Matthew chapter 16, we find that Jesus says, I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia. I will build my community. That's what Jesus is saying. And when Jesus is referring to church, when he says, I'll build my church, he does not make reference to a physical structure, but to a community of believers. This is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus did not die for events or buildings. He died for you and I. And praise God for that. So God brought this particular group of people. He brought all of us together in West Lafayette for a reason, for a purpose. He wants us to live in community, and there's a reason behind it. Uh, This is what our passage this morning was talking about. In Hebrews, that we're to spur one another on, help each other to, toward love and good works, and we're not to neglect meeting together. There's reasons behind these things. Jesus did not say he would build a crowd of people and put them in buildings. He said he would build a movement of people dedicated to his purpose on the earth. That was his intention. It was a community that motivates one another toward love and good works, a community that does not neglect getting together. And so what we know is, as you look at history, you look at church history, for 1,900 years, when Christians went to church, they went to church with people who knew them incredibly well Monday through Saturday. Think about this in history. So as you came into church 100 years ago, everybody knew you before you walked into the building, and they knew what you had done that week. That was what it started out as. Everyone knew what was happening in each other's lives. People often attended their neighborhood or their city denominational church, and it was a smaller setting where everybody knew everyone else's business. And there's pros and cons to that, right? It's a good thing, and then there's, uh, maybe they know too much, you know? But but we know that that was the setting. When people went to church, it was an incredibly different environment than what we have today. When we go to church today, it's with people who don't really know a whole lot about us, right? That's the setup today. We go to church with strangers, mostly acquaintances and maybe some family members who maybe know us pretty well. In this environment, it impacts some things. And I've mentioned this before in one of the other messages I shared, it was like a year and a half ago. I just talked about the very simple thing in terms of the way that we greet one another. You know, like the greeting, how are you? Which it was funny after I shared that message, because when I get into this content here, you'll know why. (laughs) People, after that, like a week later, instead of asking that question, they were like avoiding one another altogether. Like, no, that wasn't the point. Because so often when we say, how are you, what you're saying is, I see you. We don't really mean, how are you? And we respond accordingly. So somebody says, how are you, which is translated, I see you. And they say, good, great, no matter what's going on in their lives. That's the response. You know, my parents are going through a divorce. I've lost my job. I have no way to pay my school bills, but everything is awesome in my life. You know, that's how we respond, is it not? That's our 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 natural way to go. So I was talking with a couple of other uh, staff members about this, and they said, you know, we should just make like a I see you Sunday. So instead of asking each other, how are you, just say, hey, I see you, and keep walking. (laughs) Might as well call it for what it is, right? But the challenge is, somewhere in your life, you have to have people who, when they say, how are you, they actually mean, how are you? They want to know the answer to that question. And when you give them the answer, the token answer, good, great, I'm wonderful, they actually dial in and say, no, really, how are you doing? They really start to dive into the life of who you are. You've got to have a space in your life where that question is being asked and where people actually mean it. And so the question is, what's happened in the church where it's no longer a place where all of these things are happening? And really, all it is is it's mobility, better known as a car. That's what happened. You know, the automobile, it's not new, but the sense of it being everywhere like it is today, it's kind of a new thing. Go back 50 years. 
Maybe I could ask you, how many of you can remember the day, and doesn't matter your age, I'm not trying to, you know, highlight certain age categories here this morning, but how many of you can remember being in a household where you had one car? One car. 50 years ago, that was what was commonplace. Dad drove the car to work, he worked, he'd come back, maybe mom would go get groceries on evenings or weekends. You had one vehicle to get around in. Well, now we've got two and three car garages, and you can have a car for every driving member of your household. So it's a very different thing today when you look at how mobile people are, how much they can get out. And so mobility, it caused some cultural shifts. You know, where people used to choose what was closer, the nearest grocery store, the nearest hardware store, the nearest church, now it became, I'm going to choose what's better. So this is where then we got into the age of big hardware stores and even big churches. You know, what we find in a church of 300 or more is that we wind up going to a church of acquaintances who know our image a lot more than our reality. And talk about the way social media has driven that. You know, I'm not taking pictures of me brushing my teeth in the morning. That's not what we're displaying to the world. We, d- we choose what kind of image we're going to portray to the world. And social media helps us with that. You know, but what I will say is this, is there's obvious advantages to a larger church. As we have great kids programs, the more that we can do to touch the world, it's incredible that we from this place can be a part of impacting Latin America and China and all these places around the world. So there's great advantages to a larger church, but we also have to recognize at the same time there's subtle challenges that we have to make sure that as we continue to grow that we address those along the way. Because as the church remains a crowd, here's the biggest thing, as the church remains a crowd, it doesn't change people's lives. I'm convinced of that. If a church remains a crowd, you will not see people's lives changed, not truly changed. Uh, Larry Osborne, a small group guru, guru, guru. that's a nice word. How do you spell that? G-U-R-U, is that what it is? Small group guru, I want to say it a couple times. He pastors a church in California, and he actually addresses some of these issues in terms of what happens in a church as it becomes more of a crowd than a community. So what I want to get into today is understand that we can't be a crowd. We have to be a community of people. We have to drive toward that with great intentionality. Otherwise, there's things that are going to be missed. And here's the first thing. The church has slowly become in our culture something we go to instead of something that we are. That's why I highlight the definition of a church. The church is oftentimes something we go to instead of something that we are. So often when I come up and I I talk about Shelly and I being lead pastors of Connection Point Church, I then go on to say, we get to lead this incredible group of people. Why? Because the church is people. It's not meant to be something we go to and then go out to lunch afterward. The church is meant to be a group of people. It's who we are. The church has for many become a program, a place where we arrive, and we can unfortunately become consumers asking the question, what's in it for me? And this is why so many people, they shop for a church that works for them. And not that that's a terrible thing to find, God, where do you want me to invest my time? What community of believers would you have me develop in? That's an okay question to ask, but here's the challenge. It can be problematic for people who plug into a setting for a year, and when they become challenged to say, well, I'm just not working here anymore, I'm going to go and check out these people over here and fish with them for a while. Only then to a year later find out I'm still being challenged, so they're going to keep continue looking around. That's not what God intended the church to be. And we've got to be careful that that, that's not the habit that we get into. I said it before, and I'll say it again. In our American cultural Christianity environment, which I like to call Christian consumerism, that's our default. We have to stop doing the church. We have to start being the church. We're not meant to do church. We're meant to be the church. And what that looks like outside of these walls is very different. So I want to let you know, we're not here just doing church. That's why Shelly's going to come up and interrupt a song and say, we're here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're not just here to sing a few songs and go out and feel happy. We're here to worship God, and we're asking him what you desire of our lives. And the way that we start being the church is we do this. We commit ourselves to a body of believers to grow in and not give up on. We commit ourselves to people that say, I want to grow with you. I don't want to give up on you. The second crowd-causing issue, this is the way that a church becomes a crowd. The second is, is people view Christianity as a private relationship with Jesus. And let me say this, your, your relationship with Jesus is personal, but it's not private. Your relationship with Jesus is personal, but it's not private. There's a big difference. 
Because when churches climb to two to three hundred and beyond, what can happen is, is we can come in, sing songs, be charged up, and head out from here. But that's not really what we're meant to just be doing. That's start of the problem is, is that when our faith becomes a private relationship, here's the problem. We start down a path towards sin because what we start to do is we judge what feels good to us instead of what Scripture has to say about an issue. We can't go down that road. We need our brothers and sisters in faith to hold us accountable to right living toward acts of love and good works. This is what we're asked. This is the iron sharpening iron. We know that scripture. And the third challenge of living in a crowd instead of community is that we have nowhere to live out the one another's of faith. We're asked to be something for one another. There's all kinds of scriptures tied to it. Over 30 commands in scripture of things we're to do for one another. 30 commands. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to encourage one another. We're to pray for one another, confess our sins to one another, help one another. There's a list that goes on and on. And if we're not in community, we can't live out the one another's. Connection Point Church cannot remain a crowd. It must make an intentional shift toward genuine, authentic, life-transforming community because you were made for community. And you were made for community in the church. You were made for community in the church. Go back to that scripture from this morning, Hebrews chapter 10. Here's what it says. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. That scripture is really important. We're to get together as a church for very specific reasons, to encourage one another. Isn't it wonderful to come together and be encouraged in the faith? We need it. We're to motivate one another. That word means to agitate, to spur on, to love and good works. So when we come together in community, it means that we have to help one another to be motivated toward love and good works. So what the implication is, is our natural inclination is not to be loving and do good things. So in the Christ community, in the body of Christ, we can say, you know what, this is an area you maybe could grow in. These verses are saying... Here's what it's saying. You know, it says, do not uh, miss opportunities to meet together. It's not so much a verse on saying you've got to be in church every Sunday. What it's saying is, is you've got to have godly peer pressure in your life. You need people in your life who are going to influence you in godly ways. This is really what this verse is about. And you must live in this way for three very important reasons. And the first is this. You've got to be in an environment where you're genuinely known. You must be genuinely known. This is important for you. You will never be everything God has called you to be if you're able to live a pretending life, if you're able to live as an image. That's not God's design for you. Somewhere in your life, somewhere in my life, we've got to be able to be genuinely known. And the second thing is this. You need to be lovingly supported. Christianity is not a solo sport. This is why when people make a decision to follow Christ, the first thing we do is say, hey, somebody's going to call you so that they can answer your questions. We want you doing life with another brother or sister in the faith. If you're going to become all that God wants you to be, you not only need to be genuinely known, but where you have issues and things that you're struggling with and burdens you're carrying that you shouldn't be carrying, you need to be lovingly supported because God has not designed the Christian life to be lived alone. And the third thing is this. You must, to do everything that God wants you to do, to be everything God wants you to be, you need to be honestly challenged. And not just challenged with what we share on a Sunday morning. That's really not what I'm talking about. I mean, you need to have people in your life that can confront you on things that you need to deal with. Somebody that's going to say, hey, Bill, seems like you've been spending no time at home. Your, your kids, they need a dad. Your wife, she needs a husband. You need people who are going to honestly challenge you in the life that you live. Here's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes. This quote's a challenge, and I'll tell you up front. Nothing can be more cruel than the leniency which abandons others to their sin. Nothing can be more compassionate than the severe reprimand which calls another Christian in one's community back from the path of sin. It's in a book, Life Together. It's talking about Christian community. You know, we like to avoid confrontation. But if you know somebody's not living right, the most loving thing you could do is actually to talk with them about it. What kind of community are we living in? And you could ask, now, Pastor, why do we need these things so badly? Why do I need to be genuinely known? Why do I need to be lovingly supported? Why do I need to be honestly challenged? And that's a fair question. And you must be genuinely known. Here's why. Because anonymity breeds sin. Anonymity breeds sin. 
Our fallen nature needs to be kept in check. It just does. This is best done in a community and not in a crowd. We like our private lives. Our Constitution even says we have a right to privacy. And I don't have a problem with that, except when it's read into the Bible. There's no right to privacy in the Bible. We're called to live as an open book. You know, there's so much freedom in your soul when you live this way. I don't know how many people I've talked with and counseled who have said when they were willing to depart from the sin they were living, when they were able to own up to it, the freedom that they felt flood into their soul in that moment. There's freedom in living as an open book. And so here's one of the things I want to encourage you to do, to avoid anonymity. Here's what you can do. Instead of confronting people to say that's none of your business, you could actually say it's all your business. Live a life of transparency. And there's freedom in your soul when you do it. So the reason we must be genuinely known is because anonymity breeds sin. And the reason we must be lovingly supported is because some things are too big to face alone. In a crowd culture of everything's good, right? How are you doing? I'm good. People often fall out of the church because they're carrying things they were never meant to carry alone. Here's what we find Paul writes in Galatians. He gives us some instruction here. He says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then has reason to boast, uh, will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Do you like how that's bookended? So which one is it? Bear your own burdens or bear one another's burdens? And the answer is both. If you're carrying a backpack size load, carry it yourself. Don't be needy. There's, There's a balance there. But if you've got a trunk to carry you'd better ask somebody in the church to help you carry it. What I have found in Western culture, American culture, especially like a farming agricultural community where people are good to take care of things on their own, so often our default is on the other side that we want to try to carry that trunk by ourselves. But I challenge you, don't do it. We're in the church so that we can support one another. And the last reason we need this community qualities of being genuinely known, lovingly supported, and honestly challenged is because we need to be honestly challenged so that we can view ourselves accurately and confess our struggles. And it needs to be done with a group of people that are where you're genuinely known and lovingly supported. So let me say this last piece. You really can't be honestly challenged unless you're in a group of people where you're genuinely known and lovingly supported. When you know people have your back, those are easy people to listen to when they have something to to be able to relate to your life, a way to grow. Genuinely known, honestly challenged, and lovingly supported. James 5.16 tells us this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So you need this opportunity to be able to talk with others, to confess with one another in that safe environment so that shame can be removed, as James declares that you can be healed. You were made for community where you can be genuinely known, lovingly supported, and honestly challenged. I love this quote from the book Community that's that's a, that is Christian from Julie Gorman. Here's the quote. Consider this. You cannot play at community development. She's talking about the church environment. It is essential to who we are and profound enough in its implications to keep us pursuing it until it climaxes in that great communal celebration of lamb and bride. Community is a way of life. We don't like, think of being responsible for others. I, I don't like being my brother's keeper. Nor do I want any other heaven responsibility for me. Dependency is on the most feared list today. Self-disclosure is relegated to the professionals whom I pay to listen. Vulnerability and weakness are dangerous. Commitment is too binding and controlling. It's easy to settle for a counterfeit or substitute because of the cost to us of pursuing real community. We must not settle for small group times that are as good as a garden club or the local Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And here's what she says. Community is distinctly Christian. And it is. Community is distinctly Christian. And so I'd ask, where do you find yourself in community today? You know, a day where we're going to sign up for connect groups, that's at least a start in that right direction where you can find a place of belonging. And so I want to encourage you, sign up for a connect group today. But before we do that, I do want to ask, if there's anybody here today that would say, you know what, I've been out of community first and foremost with God, and it has to start there. But maybe you'd say, but I don't want to be out of community with God today. And so if that's where you're at, I just want to take a moment to pray with you. So with every head bowed here this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to say, I want to be in community with God today. So if that's you and you'd say, I've been out of community, but I want to be in community with God. I want my life to be centered on him. I want to be reconnected with my creator. If that's you today, 
If you just raise your hand, I want to pray with you before we depart from this place this morning. Anybody here today say, that's me. I want to be in community with God today. Anybody else over here in the middle? Anybody else that say, I want to be in community with God? Over here on the left, anybody else that would say, that's me today? I want to follow after God. Well, let me pray with you this morning before we depart. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would lead us into greater depths of community. God, first and foremost, we want community with you today. We want to be reconnected with you as our creator. We want to know you personally. And so, God, I just pray for those that raise their hands today. I just pray that you'd lead them into community with you today. May they acknowledge fully their need of you, and may you meet them there today. God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, that we can be in community with you. And so, God, I pray that we wouldn't miss that opportunity today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.